Hi everybody and welcome to another CaliCube Tuesdays, another monthly roundtable with WordLift today with Emilia Georgetska. Absolutely correct. <laughs> and Sarah Mokansaya, I'm going to sing. A quick hello and we're good to go. Welcome to the show, Emilia and Sarah. <laughs> so Love this song. Well, I know you two are great friends. Uh, we're all great friends, so this is going to be a lot of fun. And talking about the body and soul of Google search, how entity linking and entity, entity SEO helping better content and brand understanding is going to be huge. Uh, welcome to you, the audience who are here. Please do post your questions in the chat. We will try to get to them either as we go along, if it fits in with the flow, or at the end. And we've got an hour in front of us to go through the body and soul of Google search, which I've suddenly got terribly <laughs> delighted with as a title. Oh, so, my God. It is true, no? Best title ever. I mean, Emilia came up with it, and it was like, <laughs> wow. A hundred percent. Absolutely. I... No, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, please go. No, no, I was uh... going to say, please, please present yourself, Emilia, and tell us yeah. what we're going to be talking about. Uh, of course. So first of all, thank you guys for the given opportunity that you're following us on this topic. I'm super happy that I'm uh, having this chance to talk with uh, friends of mine and also experts in their field, Sarah and uh, Jason. Uh, I'm Amelia. My formal background is in computer science and engineering, but I mix it with technical marketing. I've been focusing on content engineering in the past five years specifically. So this is uh, the topic of today and how we can use entity SEO and entity leaking to bo boost your brand development strategies and also content engineering efforts overall. But that's only about the backend side of the story, <laughs> of course. Now that's the, the soul, but the soul means nothing with the, the body itself. So this is where Sarah comes in. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Emilia. So, okay, the part that we are all friends is already done, so I don't have to explicit it again. So, yes, I'm Sara. Uh, I'm an SEO specialist. I work at Leap. I often collaborate with Jason, too. We have our thing <laughs> that we enjoy together doing. And, yes, and I will be speaking about entity SEO. Uh, so, the front end part <laughs> so the the google part what we can see and then um, we will link everything together to make sense right which is a brilliant way of putting it now i'm wondering amelia you said that the geeky stuff is the soul and the brand is the body but i would it's... argue the geeky stuff is the body and the brand is the soul <laughs> Yeah, well, it's always debatable. It's very interesting discussion, which kind of maybe can bring me to the introduction of the topic overall and how I got involved into the field. So when I was starting out uh, my uh, web of data courses at my faculty of computer science and engineering in Skopje, where I studied, I never imagined myself that I would be into content marketing and content engineering overall. Mm. But as time passed, I realized that semantic SEO and semantic uh, content efforts are a thing, even though we really need to distinguish between what a semantic SEO is and what entity SEO is. So I'm kind of jumping topics here a bit uh, from this and there, but I'll try to be on point as much as I can. So first of all, when we talk about semantic SEO, this, there are many uh, articles out there that cover the topic of semantic SEO and explaining that you need to learn uh, how to use related keywords, related phrases that are on the same topic, that have good entity salience and so on. But no one explains what we do when we identify these entities, no matter their mm. main entities or related keywords. What we do with them? How do we use them? How do we link to what Google knows, to what knowledge bases know? So this is the key difference that exists out there to enable uh, the, give us the path to explain what's the main difference between semantic SEO on the one side and entity SEO where the focus is on the entity itself and not its related uh, concepts and uh, stuff, but the entity itself and its entity description. So this is how I wanted to start my discussion today. And the connection to tech is obviously becoming more and more prominent over the years, especially with this new search generative AI experience that is uh, already rolled out uh, worldwide in many countries. 
So we really need to be mindful about how we approach the, our efforts and how do we plan for the future? How do we structure our teams? How do we plan for entity SEO efforts? How we train people to follow these processes and frameworks within their own teams and across functionally? So this is what I'm going to cover today. Brilliant. But when you say there are two things that strike me, number one is plan. And that's a lot what a lot of companies don't do. And the second is we need to start thinking as humans more like machines. Exactly. That's the key thing. Uh, so the, 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 the key component in it here, here is to find a way to use the knowledge about how do we know how machines work, but also comp- bind it with our human intelligence, which is on the front, front, forefront of our efforts, and how we can combine these both worlds to the best, uh, in the best possible way so that we can develop solid entity SEO-based strategies that are going to move our content marketing efforts forward. It sounds like a cliche, but I've been two times agency side, two times in-house. I worked four plus years as a freelancer and I know that this is a struggle uh, that companies face and their clients face accordingly. Right, brilliant. And now Sarah, if you bring the, the, the brand aspect into it, if we speak like machines, we're not gonna communicate very well with our audience. Yes. And the sure. brand is gonna look un, unattractive. What would you say to that, Sarah? Well, I would say I'm in between. <laughs> I am like, speak like a human, but a human that a machine understand. <laughs> because, Perfectly uh, explained. Now, because... see the clarity of thought that she has. <laughs> Thank you, Emilia, about that. Uh, but uh, yes, because um, uh, I, I have an auntie. She's a journalist and she's fantastic. I swear on God, when she speaks, I understand half of what she's saying. So she will, she, she will explain me a concept, very complex context, uh, context with something with wording that I don't even know what they mean. I was with her during lunchtime, so I know it. And, and, um, and then I, I, when I see her, when I see people speaking like this about their brand, for example, I always question myself. What the machine will understand if I am not understanding you? Okay, maybe we can say I'm not super smart, whatever. But if I don't understand you, I doubt the machine will understand you. So for me, you have to find an equilibrium in in between. Right. And that's going to be the art and science as we move forwards, is mixing the brand with the semantics and the machine will understand, but our audience will be charmed by what we say and believe in our brand. So if we come back to that idea of semantics and and entity SEO and entity linking in the process of SEO entity linking. Um, So starting with you, Emilio, with the really pragmatic aspect, entity SEO, semantics, how do you link the two together and how do you do all of that groovy entity linking? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for the uh, bridge. Uh, So I think that it's first important to understand what entities are. An entity can be something like a shoe in a sentence. It needs to be named entity. And this is something that Dixon Jones from Inlinx pointed out perfectly well in some of his articles, that you really need to have named entities that are real world objects. And they can include stuff and persons like Martin Split, John Mueller, Sundar Pichai, like the the CEO of Google or something like that. They can be locations. They can be organizations like Google or Pinterest. They can be products. They can be events. So these are named entities that can be identified in an algorithmic way and also in a human way uh, from a given text. Text, by definition, represents some structured data. So you need to find a way to structure it. At the same time, we really need to make the, 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 um, uh, explain the blurry line between name entities and concepts. What is a named entity and what is a concept then? So I explained what named entities are, but concepts are opposite of named entities and they represent abstract objects. I can give you some examples. So for example, a mathematical or philosophical concept like distance, axiom or quantity can be 
concepts. You have physical concepts or natural phenomena. You have social concepts like authority, human rights. So you really need to differentiate between those two when you're using, especially when people are using them interchangeably. So that's the first thing. The second thing that we need to understand why the name entity linking or NEL is needed in SEO for smart search performance optimization is that um, there are many uh, situations where you can define the named entity in a text, but you really don't know unless you know it context and surrounding words. So for example, if I use uh, Michael Jackson in a setup, Michael Jackson can be a friend, a person that I know, but also Michael Jackson can be a popular uh, pop uh, star, uh, pop star that was uh, existing in the past. So depending on the context, we really need to know how to disambiguate in our mind and in our, our readers' minds about which concept do we really want to, which, uh, which entities, pardon me, we really want to um, talk about. And this is achieved through the process of entity linking. What is entity linking? Entity linking is the process when you find the name entity in the text, you find it. And then when you find this entity, you link it to our respective knowledge base which can be something like the backend of Wikipedia, which is Wikidata. It can be a knowledge base like the Google Knowledge Graph, like a knowledge graph itself. Or it can be DBpedia, it can be Yago. There are many different alternatives. So the key point is, okay, find me that I'm talking about Michael Jackson, but also give me the definition about this particular enti named entity. So this is the concept of um, entity linking. Right. One huge thing that strikes me there is the simple process of looking at the text and thinking, which Michael Jackson am I talking about, is already hugely helpful to me as a human being because it makes me more clear, which is going to help my user. It's going to help me with my thinking. So even without the linking, I'm already moving forwards in my explanations by identifying or thinking about the entities I'm talking about. Exactly. And this is not a simple process. I think that people are underestimating it because I can tell you from a computer science and engineering perspective, it requires serious scientific and computer science and engineering efforts to be done at scale. Because you really need to bear in mind, especially when you're disambiguating content that is present in different languages and in different um, uh, knowledge bases that you are going to deal with more than one million, so actually maybe even several billions of entities that you need to disambiguate against. So you need to have an algorithmical approach, how I will do this at scale. And this is what we perfectly crafted and did at WordLift. We have an established process, how we do this at scale, how do we find these entities in the text on, in a named entity uh, way. And then we disambiguate that, them against a knowledge, uh, a knowledge graph or a knowledge base. This is where the whole magic happens. But you need humans like Sarah to go. I, I have a question. Back. It's not a really question, but it's a thought that I have, and then correct me, Emilia. For for me, the way that that works is if you have a clear text. So. Mm. Uh, if already your text is confused, I, I can give you an example that just came in my mind. Like I have a friend, then he opened a company recently and he's a doctor. So he's giving a second opinion, okay? But he's never saying that he's a doctor. So the text is speaking about second opinion. You sing dress up like a, uh, like a doctor, obviously. So you can still get it, but how a machine can figure out second opinion. It could be a second opinion on finance. It could be a second opinion of a lot of things. So for me, the, the way then the text is structured should also help entity linking. What, is that correct? Or you can write whatever you want and it works. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the beauty of your communication and collaboration that we have as friends and also colleagues in the industry and experts in the field is that you have this clarity of thought about how to explain this perfectly and ask the right questions. Without asking the right questions in the first place. This is how I see the whole topic evolving from there. And you really need to provide clarity. The keyword here is clarity. How to make everything super clear for humans and search engines. Because... Even when I say search engine, I don't mean that we are doing stuff for Google. We are in the search experience uh, gen uh, and generative AI era. Uh, 
in the end, bots like Google bot and other bots are just disabled users. They can do a lot of stuff. They cannot do any, anything. And they're just the proxy between the human and the machine, which helps redistributing this content based on search intent. So how are you going to approach this if you don't care about the language that machines speak, which is basically a, a disabled user uh, language that they are using? This is how it should be. Yeah, and I think it, it, it really does help to emphasize that we're humans talking to other humans and the machine is simply between the two of us. So we do need to make that message clear to the machine so it presents us to its users, but make sure that when the message gets to those users, the user feels comfortable. So you still need the picture of the doctor in the white coat looking incredibly um, Professional and, and yes. yeah, absolutely. That's the keyword. So, so clarity and... Yep, clarity, uh, context, and using that together to build confidence in understanding, and then using entity linking to reassure and reaffirm and repeat what you're saying in the page to build and build and build that confidence that these machines have, that they've understood correctly, what the context, context and the clarity have helped them understand. I think that this is a good opportunity for me to actually show you practically because I love discussions, but what we always respected yes. at WordLift and CaliCube is the practicality aspect. And this is how mm -hmm. we do stuff. I want to show the audience. I'm going to click present. You please reassure me if you see everything yep. on your site. I'm going to try to say, uh, share, share my screen now. Uh, so uh, we have uh, this... Uh, particular uh, blog post, which is about entity-oriented SEO, how entity linking can boost your performance. I really encourage you to read it because some of the topics that we are going to cover and already covered so far are going to be uh, covered in this article. But what I actually wanted to show you is the tool that is embedded within this article. And this is the Try the Entity uh, Extraction Free Tool. So for example, here's how it looks like. It says extract entities from my content by using AI. So how does this work? Let me give you an example text. I'm going to take a text that is coming from Google Cloud API page, which is basically about Google and uh, disambiguating and everything against it. So this is a free tool. We are trying and doing our, our best to make it multilingual. Uh, it's currently working in English, but it's also going to work in German and other languages in, in um, um, future uh, as well. Please do tell us in comments which languages are you interested in so that we can optimize based on feedback. And when you click Analyze for this given content, it can be a longer piece. But in this case, for practicality reasons, I want to show it for a simple sentence how the analysis works out. So you click Analyze, and then the algorithm is working in the background. You see the are running um, uh, symbol that is working there. And then you have the named entities. So they are in a color, blue color or blue uh, shade uh, version of uh, the blue color itself. So you have uh, Google as an entity. You have Mountain View as an entity. You have CA, which is, stands for California. You have Android. We have the Consumer Electronics Show and Sundar Pichai. But what is the magic here? It's not enough just to recognize them. We need to use them in a structured way because like I said, text by default, when you see this as a text, this is unstructured data. And this is not understandable for search engines. You need to explain it somehow. So the way you do this is by seeing the annotations. So see what we are doing. For example, when we are telling the entities, the United States of America, then I am disambiguating this against Googleplex um, page of Wikimedia. And then I'm doing this context, also telling the number of employees this organization is having, sub-organization, YouTube, and so on. But this is still not the best magical part about the whole strategy. Let's try to see even further. How can I use this as a schema markup on my website? When I click the, here's the final JSON LD, and I copy it from this particular uh, output, then I can do at the current moment uh, of speaking. I can validate it against the schema validator and I can run the test. 
And you see warnings, but warnings are not errors. This is per working perfectly well. So for example, we have the Alphabet uh, Inks, that's the corporation that belongs uh, Google belongs to. And the main entity of the page links to this particular link. Let's see what we have here. So for example, when I go to lobopedia.de, we have the explanation. In this case, it's in German because this is working in German too, apparently. But uh, we have that Google Inks is a global company, so we are clearly as disambiguate against Google. We also have the same for um, United States of America, for Android, we have for the consumer electronics, for Alphabet Ins. So this is the beauty of having this uh, performed uh, at scale in an algorithmic way. But you need to be really careful about this, and Saria knows this already. When you have the multiple website schemas on your website or your web page in particular, and you want to embody this, uh, embed this within the existing content, uh, these two schemas can conflict to each other. So the way you solve for this, that there are two ways that you solve for this. The first way, your uh, Google or search engines are going to use the most complete schema that is having the details in the website schema encapsulated itself. And the second way that uh, you can solve for this, which I prefer better compared to the first one, is basically uh, make only single website schema that is going to contain all the information on the website and post it on the web page itself. Now, like I said, I'm more on the IT side. Uh, I'm the formal part. Uh, Sarah is the one that is understanding how this is happening from a uh, point of view where uh, uh, where uh, we connect the whole topic to the idea of knowledge panels. Because why? Why we do entity linking? We said the keyword before. The key reason why we are doing entity linking is to enable clarity, right? So we enable clarity this way. Why we enable clarity? Ask yourself enough times why. Because we want to avoid uncertainty in the whole situation. So how do we engineer, how do we solve for uncertainty? This is something that Sarah will uh, elaborate a bit further because she's the expert and better than me in that aspect. Am I? <laughs> okay. So anyway, uh, yes, I think then you uh, use exactly the keyword, uh, then it's like remove the uncertainty part. Again, I hope that I pronounced that correct. Uh, but uh, the the whole idea, it's like, why? First of all, why should you do that? <laughs> why should you remove the uncertainty? You know, I am sure many people went and like you always have a reference. Somebody in the SERP, then you want to copy a company, then you want to copy, and normally they're super fancy. Like they have a serve, then it's like, wow. And you're like, my company wants to have that. Now, okay, <laughs> the problem there is if the company have that, then have it all, it's because they are understood. Because there is no, that wording, uncertainty. <laughs> uncertainty. <laughs> Jazz, don't really help me on this kind of word. This is also, also the carrying process of like difficult wording for me. Okay, so uncertainty. So, um, so this is like the the thing, the first thing that you have to keep in mind. So all, all your process now is really to work and make it as clear as possible who you are, what you do, what your target audience is. Because if not, you will never reach like that uh, ideal uh, surf than you want, that ideal uh, um, surf than uh, your competitor. Or oh, oh, not even your competitor, somebody then just you want to be like that. Uh, so, uh, so the idea, it's really that. So now the question is, how do I do that? <laughs> Probably that is like the most important question is how do I arrive? To that? So Sorry, the, the, quickly before, go. just before that, because the how do we do it is, is hugely interesting, but I just wanted to bring it back to what Lydia said earlier on, which is always bear in mind it's two human beings talking to each other through the interface of the machine. If the machine doesn't understand who you are, what you do, what you offer and to whom, it can't make that interface. 
So that for me is the absolute focus. And then how do we do it? How do we get Google to understand who we are, what we do, which audience we can serve? So, well, I, I'm speaking of CaliCube, so let's speak about the CaliCube process now, <laughs> because anyway, it's something uh, that I particularly like, the, the way that is structured. Um, uh, so for me, the first part anyway is to become an entity. Okay, so whatever you do, if your company, it's not understood, it doesn't have, you know, like in the knowledge graph, that number <laughs> that everybody wants to have. So then you have to do an effort on that. You, you have to work to, uh, to make sure that you have that famous number in the uh, knowledge graph. Then uh, um, once, like I, I remember Jason helped me maybe one year ago or something like this, or, or, or just a few months ago, but like, it looks like one year ago. Uh, no, I had like, for example, um, the famous KGNID. number. The KGNID. Yes, exactly the ID, the exactly the ID. Okay. I had the famous number, but it was like empty. Like mm. I didn't have a, a knowledge panel. I had like a, a number, me, and nothing inside. So, okay, so there it was clear. There is a problem. Obviously, there is a problem. You have a number, no information, there is a problem. And that just doesn't happen to me as a human, but also happens to company. Hmm. So now what, what you do there, it's like, first you open a bottle of champagne because you have a number. And then, you know, you just have to feed the information, which is not like very easy, but it's something that you have to do. So that imply the famous clarity <laughs> that Emilia was speaking about. So that implies like, for example, understanding what your core business is and then create your definition about your core business and who you are and then these have to be very clear in your website <laughs> very clear outside of your website because if you start saying something different between internally what you're saying in your website and externally okay we already have a confusion and there what is happening the machine is guessing again it's yeah. guessing and whatever is guessing is trying trying it could be correct, not correct. So again, you want to remove all this uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty, yeah. Yeah, I say it correct. <laughs> <I> mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so the, the, really the idea, it's like you remove all the uncertainty and that is something that can help. You have to have a proper process. So with Jason, we wrote like a white paper it's the time to introduce that. Can I speak about yes. that? No. You I can. can. Okay. Okay. So uh, with Jason, we wrote a, a white paper. And for example, we define a, a process. Okay. Sorry. Oh, go no, ahead. Yeah, this use that. that. Use that. Do, no, do it. I'll no, do it, it because that's okay. fantastic. That is good to show because that already explained like, Companies. Well, this is, oh, this oh, is what oh. I want to show, but, but I got caught out by StreamYard, was this is your KGM ID here at the top. Yes. And this is your beautiful knowledge panel with the description coming from Authoritas. Um, and you've built that. And before, what you were explaining was with the KGM ID, it just showed that your website just showed this part, the left rail. So what it was saying, Google was saying, I recognize who we're talking about, but I don't have enough factual information in which I'm confident to show this part here. And it's exactly. confidence and facts. And Google is like a child. It doesn't want to state facts if it isn't 100% sure because it doesn't want to look foolish. So exactly. It's exactly that. And I think that is a perfect example because like I had my machine readable ID, but then empty. So that is really yeah. cool. Uh, we could show it there. And this is exactly what also happens to companies. So, so they can have it, but if it is empty, it's empty. And obviously you want to be like Nike, then they have like, <laughs> then yeah. when you go through it, you're like, oh. Um, okay, 
so uh, what else? Ah, okay. So here we okay. So we are going through a process. Okay. So we are speaking about the entity. Uh, so okay, I have a website. Uh, in my website, I, I mainly use it to testing. So please. Don't go and check the website like, oh, she didn't do that correctly. That's good. It, it's a testing website. Uh, but the, the interesting part is then we introduced the schema. So we discussed with JSON. We decided like to work on my about page. And on my about page, we introduced the proper schema to help. Uh, again, are we open it? Oh, you opened, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, there, I don't know if you can uh, show the code maybe at this point. Yep, and so okay. using the about page as the, the reference for machines of information about you from you. So it's exactly. looking at this and saying, that's what Sarah wants me to understand. So you have to be, once again, clear. So exactly. There is one thing that I would like to add and maybe adding that information also on. Uh, um, OK, we do that and then I will add an information. No, no, no. Go, go show the. No, I copy pasted the wrong thing. <laughs> OK, no, not a problem. There we go. And here we have the scheme markup, which will appear. There you go. Web page about page. Exactly. So there you have like all my description. Uh, same as like tons of information with the same as. <laughs> so we have like uh, all my social uh, uh, network profile, my description. Yep. I, I, I hear the same as. I want to just quickly emphasize the importance of filling uh, good data into the whole process because I think this is a huge missed opportunity. It's not just about, I mean, the data population itself represents a great opportunity for us and you who are you listening to this um, video series of CaliCube. But uh, what it's more important is to really take good care about the quality of the data that you're providing because this will be the foundational thing that you're going to use to develop from there. So Sarah did a really good job on establishing her about page, but imagine what if your and the Nike example was a perfect uh, uh, case uh, for, for this particular situation. What if you're a business that has multiple locations? How do you explain that Nike is authority in France, but also in Switzerland and um, uh, Germany, for example? So you really need to be mindful. Uh, this is the new era of brand influencing. And uh, Sarah will explain the process, but I just want to make, make a slow hint about what is going to come up next in the discussion. And that is the process of uh, EEAT. So why is this important? Because in the era of search uh, experience and generative AI, what will matter the most is how you demonstrate authority, trustworthiness, expertise, and experience. So how do you engineer for that? How do you prepare yourself for that? This is through, uh, through entity SEO, entity linking, and knowledge panel optimization. That's definitely the way, if you ask me. So, uh, okay, so let's switch to it. I didn't, I, I thought that we will not speak about that at the end, but let's go and speak about it then. Uh, so uh, let me switch quickly to that. Um, there is one thing then, um, like, okay, so what it means, uh, you already said, so I skip like the, the meaning. And again, they are to apply the signals, the uncertainty have to be removed. And there, the signals are applied to the uh, website owner, which is the publisher or the brand, or call it whatever you want, but it's like the website owner, and to the author and to the content. So now, listen to this. Author, imagine, is an entity, like I am. I, I am an entity. <laughs> I am an entity. Uh, so author is an entity. Now your company, uh, which is the publisher or the website owner, whatever you want to call it, it's an entity. Okay, so understood, understood. Ooh, good, good. Try understood if you gave the good information. Now there is the content part. Now, okay. And here it's what I wanted to arrive because I think then your approach, Emilia, 
for it is super important. Why? Because you write your content and you have to obviously have a clear content and then you are supporting the understanding with the content. So for me, and we never discussed that, but for me, putting the fact that you are an entity, then your company is an entity and using uh, your entity linking in the content, it's like a big plus because like <laughs> all the understanding is there. We, we have a Absolutely. big understanding Absolutely. there. This is the key thing that many people underestimate. Uh, like I said, we have our free tool at WordLift. This is something that you definitely need to try out. And I'm really grateful for the guys uh, there who are doing a really incredible job. Uh, full disclosure, I was working for WordLift, but currently I'm outside of WordLift and I still can attest to the full dedication that this company has uh, in order to achieve great content understanding for your particular content marketing efforts. And this is what we excel at. I think that um, finding a good way to speak human language in machine terms is the key concept there. Brilliant, absolutely perfect. And just really quickly coming back to Sarah's, this is uh, her article on signals and factors evaluating EEAT on the CaddyCube website. And I do recommend that you read that. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, we spent quite a lot of time working on it. Um, and she talks about a white paper earlier on, and it's here. Um, this one, content, content creation for generative AI, uh, and that's free, so you can go along and download it. And I co-wrote that with Sarah. And now back to, um, sorry, I'm posting that in the chat. And I wanted to come back to the, there you go, uh, the question that has just been post, posted. And I think this is hugely important. Because we skipped straight from the entity home and my representation, or sorry, Sarah's representation of herself, and straight into the EAT. What are the off-page SEO signals yeah, that so we need to work on for entity understanding? That the, this is like the, the concept. Like then, uh, this is why I like the CaliCube approach, no? Because it thinks also about that, and there is this corroboration part. Now. I didn't know if I should explain that or it's because like it's mainly was born through you just on this concept. But for me, like the corroboration part, it's really important. And if you check Google, so let me reformulate that. What is collaboration first of all? It was what we were saying before, what you say internally, like use your website because it's the instrument that you can control. And yeah. whatever is said, outside your website like in 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 where you can control in a certain sense th there have to be this connection you have to be there have to be a collaboration <laughs> a constant yeah. between what it is said internally and externally so what you can do is to make sure that externally there is a clear understanding, like what you're saying internally, okay, also externally, they're saying the same thing. But my guess is that you're asking about link building. <laughs> I don't know if it is that, but I well, guess. Just coming back a step, in fact, you've really defined it well, because on, on our own website, your own website, you, you control the entity home, you can therefore control the description, which you've written here using Google's NLP in Kelly Q Pro to make sure that Google understands it. Um, and we get the right Sarah Mokansay there. So it's understood this in the context of CaliQ Pro, which is actually without context. We then identify the fundamental facts and this creates the schema markup that we saw earlier on. And this is a really nice representation here. That schema markup is actually looks like this. It says it's an about page with audiences with uh, Sarah in the middle of it. And it talks about an organization. Oh, it's an organization and a person. That's because of the Yoast schema markup. So that is what the schema markup looks like. But then all of this is off page. Classify and cor corroborate. You classify which are the important ones. You figure out which are the important sources that Google is looking at. And then you can go through and you can make sure it corroborates that it's all consistent. It all says the same thing. So that when Google goes from your website to these other sources, it sees the same information. And that's exactly what CaliQ Pro does to build knowledge panels. 
But Sarah, I was really, I, I love the corroboration side and I'm not a huge fan of link building, but now you're going to tell us all about link building. How useful is it? Da -da -da -da. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I don't do link building, so obviously I'm probably not the best person to speak about the result of link building and everything. Uh, but uh, I... I mean, in Google documentation, they still speak, uh, they, they, say, they say something about link and they speak about mentions too. Mm. So, so, Which kind of brings me to my point that uh, what we are doing with the entity linking approach at WordLift is some sort of intelligent entity, uh, entity uh, intelligent link building, because when you're linking to a knowledge base, it goes both ways. It's not mm. just going from us linking to a knowledge base, but also the knowledge base links to us because we are following linked data principles and a word lift uh, process to enable this on our side and the side of our clients. This is how it works. And I think it's just really important to, to, to stress that mentions are wonderful. If you get a link, that's a bonus. So it's actually, for me, mention building. And that comes back to, Sarah, what we've been talking about again at CaliCube is neat and this is a new concept that we've been talking about with sarah jano and leanne notability experience expertise authoritativeness trustworthiness and transparency we brought notability to the table jano <laughs> brought transparency to the table and we have a whole article here about it introducing the concept and it's saying eeat is great but in the real world you also need transparency and you also need notability and i think this is going to be huge absolutely true absolutely true i think this is going to be uh elevated and uh developed from here just like you described it so it's already happening uh, it's true that google is not telling us everything that we should know but i think that you made a proper uh assessment of the situation and that uh, this is how things I really love this visionary thinking that both companies have at the current moment of speaking. I'm talking about WordLift and CaliCube because in order to anticipate uh, your client needs and also how you're going to prepare yourself for the era of search generative experience, you really need to know how to uh, uh, plan, how to, how to see what's going to be ahead of you in the next five to 10 years so that you can adjust accordingly a build up backwards from there. Yeah, and that, that's hugely important. I mean, a lot of people don't think ahead. They're looking at the short term and desperately trying to get something to happen in the next few months to keep their job, keep the stakeholders happy, whatever that might be. But one thing that struck me is, Sarah, you described yourself when we first met as a technical SEO. And because yet... I evolve. Because I evolve. I, I think five years for... <laughs> down the line. <laughs> yes. But, but when, when, when we wrote the white paper, the first thing you did in this white paper was go and look at the funnel. And then he said, it's not a funnel, it's a loop. And so all of a sudden that entire paper about how to create content for generative AI or for the world of generative AI is based on marketing and branding and packaging it simply for SEO. And so Sarah wrote most of this paper and it's brilliant because it brings traditional branding and marketing, the traditional funnel, which is now in our little world Sarah's loop but it's actually created by somebody else all about business and then saying how do I package my business for these machines and one thing that I love about WordLift is exactly that is what WordLift does is take your website and package it for the machines and your website should represent your business if you've got a sensible clear website structure and set website content I just want to emphasize the importance of having a human in the loop. So we are doing the entity linking at scale, but we are still enabling this uh, human in the loop aspect because the final person who is going to approve the entity linking process, meaning all the entities that are going to be found, is going to be examined by human. And this is what a lot of companies uh, that are out there are not doing properly, mm -hmm. especially given the new... Um, uh, 
proliferation of AI generated content that is done at scale. So that it's not following the human first and human centric mindset. And this, this is the key thing for the both companies. In fact, I th consider this uh, aspect to be the key advantage for both WordLift and CaliCube. And this is why um, our processes are something that I believe that people should learn from and about. 100%. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and well, one, one thing I do like is the idea of coming back to, to marketing and branding is, I mean, we talk about our strategy, the CaliQ process being branding, marketing, SEO in that order. If you've got a brand, you've got something to market. If you create the marketing materials to represent the brand, you have something to feed to the engines mm -hmm. and to your audience. So that's hugely important. And one of the things that Sarah's loop pointed very clearly for me was the digital footprint needs to be incredibly consistent. And that's not just for machines in terms of their understanding, but also for your audience. So they get a consistent message all the way down the funnel at every single touch point. What do you think of that, Sarah? So yes, uh, so everything started when we were starting. Uh, so let me give a bit of background so then uh, people can understand. So when we started analyzing chatbots, so everything started with chatbots and, and we were like, okay, but they're coming up with questions and they're pushing people down the funnel. And then we were like, hmm, <laughs> interesting. So if you are not in, in, in like, they, they have two options. They push you down the funnel to your brand or they push you to your competitor brand. <laughs> so, so, so that was the moment where uh, Jason and I were, were thinking and, and then we came up like with, uh, with the entire idea of paper. And then I was like, okay, I will just try to check the story of funnel. But then each stuff that I was checking, I was like, uh, it doesn't look correct for the machine. Mm. Uh, to, to, it doesn't look like the machine is really pushing you down, but we need to feed the correct information. And then we started discussing and then we figure out this famous loop together. Then he, he quotes Sarah's loop, which is absolutely not Sarah's loop, but he quotes <laughs> Petrovic something. Uh... It's in the white paper. It's in the white paper, <laughs> double the white paper. <laughs> and uh, um, yes, and then it was there then I think then also with the arrival of generative AI, I also did a switch of mentality. Mm. So this is also why is, I, I, at, at the end of the day, I'm still a tech SEO, but with the switch of mentality. Uh, so, so I see the importance of having a larger vision than just SEO. Mm. I see how all uh, uh, core, uh, core departments, if you are in a big company, have to work together to arrive to the huge result, to the big uh, satisfying result. And for me, if everybody don't work together, then you are already... Absolutely correct. Absolutely yeah, correct. Saying... And I think that this was beautifully explained. Uh, I cannot emphasize, emphasize the importance of uh, having a broader understanding. And this starts with not just with uh, just understanding the brand, but also understanding the business model in the first place. So we really need to dedicate a lot of time. And this is what we do at WordLift. We dedicate a lot of time understanding what our clients are representing, what their brand voice is, and how can we prepare them for what it's about to come in the next year or is already halfway there. I'm talking about the generative AI experience. And this is also what perfect uh, what CaliCube does perfectly. This is why the bond between SEO, content marketing, and branding uh, works on the best possible way where they're interconnected together. Right, which... which oh, sorry, go ahead, Sam. No, 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 I was just saying I love it. It's exactly <laughs> that. Which, which brings us back. Sarah and I were talking about the, um, the quality rate of guidelines. And I mentioned that Google had changed in December last year the references to website to website publisher. And it was something that I think slipped under the radar for a lot of people is they talk about content, author, and the website publisher. Uh, they actually call it something else. What did they call it? Website owner. 
website owner. And so what they're saying is we're not looking at the website anymore. We're looking at the website owner. If we can't figure out who the website owner is, then we can't evaluate EEAT or NEAT, as we call it in CaliQ. Same thing for the author. If I can't figure out who the author is, I can't apply any or all NEAT signals. And so that fundamental importance is, does Google understand the website owner? Does it understand who the author is and why they're authoritative? And does it understand the content? And that's then straight back to you, Amelia. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the the whole entity linking and branding uh, and knowledge panel concept is perfectly uh, created and developed for people who want to develop their about us sections. Like uh, Sarah said, uh, this is not just for individuals like Sarah is in this particular case to develop their understanding of the uh, individual entity as a person, but also on a company level. So do that. Populate your data. Find a good software provider that is going to take care after your digital footprint and maintain this in the best possible way. Because the new era and the pivotal uh, moment for SEO is already here. What you're going to do about it, it's up to you. But my advice, and I assume that everyone's advice will be to take care after your stuff, monitor your digital footprint, and maintain the health of your digital pr- footprint at the same time. Oh, right. I really like that because that's exactly what CaliQ Pro is designed to do. Monitor and look after your digital footprint over time. Um, a lot of the people who use it think, oh, I can just turn it on, do an audit, switch it off. And I would argue 100% you need to do this constantly uh, because the environment is constantly changing, your market is constantly changing, you're constantly changing, and Google's algorithms are constantly changing. What do you think of that, Sarah, with your additional comments on that? So for me, I was smiling because at the moment that Emilia was speaking, I was waiting you to do the connection because I could see the connection. <laughs> so I was waiting for that. And two seconds after you were, and by the way, <laughs> so that was funny for me. But um, yes, so this is 100% what you say, because um, there is one thing, then uh, it's very human, mm. uh, which is, we don't think on the long run, okay? No. Because when you are hired to take care of the marketing of the company, for example, they're asking you results now. Hmm. So you will arrive and you want to do your own footprint. So you will arrive, you will come with great idea and you will suggest a new strategy, a new definition of the company, which in your opinion, it will be much better than the guy that was there two years before you. Uh, And then you will change everything. And then you're going outside and you are changing your definition. And here we go. And now the confusion starts again because for two years, somebody had defined you in a different way then you arrive and you are defining now. So what do you do now? So for me, that makes sense. It's like a website is evolving. Your company is evolving because your strategy is evolving. It is evolving because new people are coming. It's evolving yeah. because everybody have pressure of results. This impact the, the environment of, of your website and the way then you are expressing yourself outside. So yes, so for me, you need consistency in, uh, in updating the information. Yep, consistency on your website, around the web and over time. And as you say, somebody comes in, changes the way you're speaking about the company, and all of a sudden what you're saying on your entity home isn't the same as what's being said around the web, and Google's going to get confused, Bing's going to get confused. And here we have a, another question from George York, who's terribly enthusiastic today with the questions, and I think this is for Amelia. Oh, but do you, su- yeah, sorry. Go ahead. do you suggest a maximum number of entities to link inside structured data? I guess that if you link too many entities, it might confuse the search engine. This is absolutely true. So that is why I said that we have the human in the loop aspect. We do the entity mm-hmm. linking, that we do the heavy lifting for you. But you are the one that needs to go through the entities. They're going to have correct entity descriptions, I'm sure. But what you need to do, okay, is 
there's some entity that is kind of looking off compared to the other entities. Let's say that if I'm talking about music, that I'm suddenly going to have a concept that is covering the topic of, uh, I don't know, boots. let's say chairs boots. or boots no. doesn't really make uh, and something that it doesn't make sense in a way. So the way you do this is uh, filtering the entities that we found out for you and excluding them from the tool. We already have this in our plans at WordLift. Maybe you can play around if we have also beta um, uh, versions and also um, trial versions. That, that's what I meant. So that you can try to play around, but also with the tool. Try to uh, enable only the entities that seem most important for your aspect and eliminate the rest. Hope this Brilliant. helps. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's like keyword stuffing. Um, putting too much of one thing is always going to ruin it. Um, and with my daughter, when she was small, our key phrase was a little bit of everything, not too much of anything. And I really like that concept of don't overdo it because we all do as human beings. We get overexcited with the new toy and entity linking is going to be something that people get tend to get very overenthusiastic about. Um, so that, that's super. Sarah, did you want to talk anything more about the, oh no, I don't know right now if it's the body or the soul, but the front end? about how we present ourselves as businesses, because the geeky stuff, you can talk to Emilia, you can talk to WordLift, they can build your internal knowledge graph, but what do you do as a business with that? And how do you leverage that as a business into search generative experience, Bing chat, and the future? So you safeguard your future business. So um, so there was this, uh, this graph, which uh, I obviously don't have here, sadly, about Fabrice Canel. Then he was explaining like when people use a uh, search engine and when people use chatbot. And this for me yeah. is a basic lovely graph. Why? Because people go to search engine to search for your brand. Like if they have like a, a navigational query, so I don't know, uh, uh, Nike uh, Jordan. Ooh, I remember the name of Nike. Okay, Nike Jordan. Okay, you want to buy your Nike Jordan, then you go there and you write Nike Jordan. Okay, so branded query. Now, imagine, imagine how much can come out from Nike Jordan. So again, you want to make sure that, ah, this one, echo, yeah. this one, this is the graph. So as you can see here, everything that is a little bit remove the little bit. Everything that is like very branded is going on the search. Everything that you kind of know and you have more question is going to the chatbot. Okay. So the how to informational queries that normally you have chatbot. Navigational search. Hmm. So now typically navigational is branding. So typically uh, I, I want CaliCube, I will write CaliCube and I will go and search. And now what you want is then you dominate the brand. Like you want your brand to dominate mm. all over. So for me, that is, uh, um, it's what you want to obtain. What it was the question? Just I lost myself. I went in my thoughts. I went in my thoughts and then I was like, but now how I tie it back to what it was the real question. From what I've understood from what you said so far is, is, is navigational search. So you will tend to focus on the search results for your branded queries. And mm -hmm. for chat, it's bringing the person down the funnel. And what you need to do is insert your brand into the generic funnel so that it becomes your funnel. And they, therefore, you need to get Bing and Google to understand what your funnel looks like with all the relevant questions and answers. And that's going to be a huge part of the world to come. And not to mention... Not sorry, not just to stick with search engines. For people, it's hugely helpful to have the answers to your questions as you come down the funnel. And if we don't provide them, who will? Our users, our competitors, our enemies. Anyway, thank you very much. I thought I'd end with a bit of scariness. Thank you so much. Uh, Anita, do you want to say one last thing about the back end or the body or the soul? Um, first of all, I want to say thanks for everybody who attended this uh, webinar and uh, were there for, to learn more about how to organize their content processes and operations. If you do have any questions, feel free 
to ping me on LinkedIn. I will do you a favor to try to help you for free. Uh, this is uh, what we do um, uh, internally. Sometimes we help the community. We are re really dedicated to the SEO community overall and helping each other. So we also learn from your questions, your feedback, and your uh, input. Uh, when it comes to mixing the body and soul or Google search, I think that we did a good job on combining both because uh, when wherever I'm getting too technical, Sara is getting more human. So this is how uh, the perfect uh, world blends into a single uh, coherent body. And this is how it should work. I hope this webinar was super useful for everyone who attended. It's going to be live on YouTube and you can rewatch it. So to take your notes, notes and pass it through if you find it useful for other people in your uh, network. That's brilliant. Thank you. Sarah, last words from you. So thank you so much. Thank you for everybody joining. Uh, thank you to both of you because it's always fun to be with Emilia and Jason. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you, Jason, for helping me out at the end. And I was like, what was the question already? <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you so much for linking everything together. And it was exactly what I wanted to say, but couldn't remember the question. <laughs> so I think then we, uh, we have a good, like, uh, we understand each other really well. So thank you, and uh, it is fantastic to be also with you, Emilia, and for the, I love your tool, the thing that you're doing, and thank you, everybody. Yeah, ciao, Monse. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for watching. That was absolutely delightful. And we'll see you next time for another Cali Keep Tuesdays monthly roundtable with Wordlift. And actually, we've got another Cali Keep Tuesdays right after this, another special with Zara Altair and Benjamin. Cali Cube. It's all about your brand, Serp.